This morning, I think I've already mentioned, we're looking at uh, John chapter 2, the example of our Lord Jesus Christ having cleansed the temple. And I'll just point out uh, at this point that this is one of two times that we believe our Lord Jesus Christ did this. Um, Jesus was zealous for His Father's glory, and that's what we want to see that, uh, that the Lord desires to do in us as well this morning. So let's, um, let's read as we begin John chapter 2, uh, verses 12 through verse 17. John chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. John writes this, After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and He found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And He made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, He said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. May the Lord bless his uh, word to our hearing this morning. Now again, we've been asking the, the question about what it means to know Jesus Christ. And I'll ask you again this morning, do you know him? Not only that Jesus exists, uh, that he, you know, that what the Bible says about him is actually true, and not just knowing about him, and and really not even knowing him just in a personal way, but do you know him in an experiential way? Is his image, his likeness, his character uh, being formed in you? Now, we read in Scripture that Jesus loved those who were around him. Sometimes we might miss, you know, maybe interpret what he was doing not so much as a loving thing, such as when he made this, this whip, this scourge, and drove these people out of the temple. But I, I'll remind you that that actually was a loving thing because what they were doing was wrong and he was stopping them from doing it. We might, as a matter of fact, I think, as we read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, that that one image he gave of um, Christian and hopeful getting off the path and getting ensnared and then being released and by, by their Lord and then being told to lay on the ground while they were scourged may have actually come from this particular example. This, this scourging was an act of discipline because these were His people. Jesus loved those around Him and He, as we saw, laid down His life for them. Are, are you loving those around you? Are you laying down your life for them as Jesus did? We also know that Jesus loved His Father with His whole being, with all of His heart, His mind, and His soul. And He did all that He did to, to honor Him. Is that what you're doing? Is Christ being formed in you in this way? Do you love Him uh, in this way? And I'm not asking you if you love Him perfectly because none of us here do. But are you growing in that love? Are you growing in that likeness? Because that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is what He does in the hearts of His people. Now, this morning, the Lord gives all of us another opportunity to measure our love by comparing it to Jesus' love. Now, really, we have, although I want to focus mainly on one thing here, I do think we have uh, three things, all of which would be an example of Jesus' zeal for good works and His love for His Father. But it's the demonstration of His love for His family, His love for His Father's commandments, and His love for His Father's glory. And I've got to be careful with that third category because the other two really fall into that as well. But hopefully you'll see what I mean as we go through these. Now this again is what the Lord is working in you. In anything that Jesus does, there has to be a counterpart to that in our lives because His Spirit is in us working that same character. If you know Him, you will walk as He walked. You will live as He lived. And actually, that is a great blessing that we can be transformed in that image. 
So let's look at these three things. And the first question I would ask you this morning is this. Do you love your family as Jesus loved His family? And I get that really just from, from verse 12. Now, by the way, I'm going to back up just a little bit and look at, at where it is they were coming from as they go back to Capernaum. Uh, they're actually, um, before this, in that wedding that we're all very familiar with, the wedding in Cana of Galilee, where Jesus performed His very first miracle because the wine had run out during a wedding celebration that He, His family, and His disciples had been invited to attend. Now, apparently, those who organized this event didn't plan on this many people, or maybe the celebration went a little bit longer than they hoped, or maybe people were drinking a bit more freely than they expected. Um, so they ran out of wine. Now, not only did Jesus turn the water into wine, which obviously was a miracle that uh, served to prove that He was the Messiah, that's what miracles were meant to do. Not only did He show us that uh, though it may be a sin to get drunk, it's not a sin to drink, again, as, you don't, as long as you don't drink to excess or come under the power of that drink, but He showed us that He was sensitive to the needs of those around us, around Him. And the wedding in particular, you know, being a time to uh, celebrate uh, a man and a woman entering into a, a covenant, a lifelong covenant which was actually meant to be a symbol of Jesus' love for His church. That's what a, you know, a, a marriage is all about. Uh, Jesus loves His church even as, uh, we are to, as husbands are to love their wives and the church to submit to Christ, as, uh, or I should say wives are to submit to their husbands as the church does to Christ. But He honored this celebration, um, basically showing us uh, by providing this better wine that he was concerned about the needs around him. And so we should see this as an act of love, of, of being sensitive to, uh, to, to the needs around us and doing what we can to help, especially when what is being done is something that is honoring to the Lord, which is what this wedding was. Now, I didn't want to focus on that, but just point that out. Now, notice that after the wedding, Jesus went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. In other words, he was there with his family. He was bringing his family to Capernaum, and they were going to stay there for a few days before Jesus left to go to Jerusalem uh, to that event, which we're going to focus on this morning. But I don't think that Jesus and his disciples were merely following his family to Capernaum, but rather that Jesus was settling his family there, because we do read that that is where they actually lived. They were no longer in Nazareth, but now they were living in Capernaum. And I want you to notice that as it talks about Jesus and His mother and His brothers, that there's no mention of Joseph here. So by the time that Jesus' ministry is beginning, Joseph is already gone. Now, what is Jesus doing here? Well, I think that what Jesus is doing is, as, as the eldest son, He's caring for His family, making sure that their needs are met, even during the time of His ministry. Now, here again, we have an example that comes from our Lord Jesus Christ to us, that Jesus, as we already saw, was not only an obedient and respectful child to His parents, not only did He, as a youth, avoid the pitfalls of youth that it seems is, is almost universal uh, in, in our society today that our youth fall into, but as a young man, He provided a perfect example to us of one who continued to care for his parents, to continue to love and honor his mother and his family. Now, as parents, you know the importance of taking care of your children, of providing for your children, of protecting your children, of teaching your children in the way they should go. We understand that as parents, that is our obligation, that is our duty. But do you realize, as children, and all of us here are children yet. We still have the responsibility to love and honor and care for our parents. And of course, if you happen to be the eldest in the family and you also have siblings, you're responsible for them as well. Now, you're particularly responsible for your parents, of course, as they get older and they can no longer care for themselves. Just as they cared for you 
when you were helpless, and we were all once helpless. So we need to care for them when they become helpless. Basically, this is God's retirement program. I would also draw your attention to the fact that when Jesus Christ was on the cross and He looked down from the cross and saw His mother and saw His disciple whom He loved, John, uh, down at the base of the cross, He said to His mother, woman, behold your son. And by that, He didn't mean look at me, but He said, look at John, that's, that's your son. And then He said to the disciple, behold your mother. In other words, John, look. Mary is your mother, and from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. In other words, Jesus continued to love his family, and he continued to care for them, even from the cross when he was about to die. And of course, if you're going to follow Jesus, you should do that as well. That's what it means to know Jesus. So first of all, Jesus cared for his family. Now, secondly and briefly, let me ask you the second question. Do you love and obey Jesus' commandments in the way that Jesus loved and obeyed His Father's commandments? We read that the, in verse 13, the Passover was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, why did He go there? Well, it's because this was universally required by God of all the Jewish males throughout Israel. Three times a year, they had to appear before the Lord in Jerusalem. And so Jesus went up to honor His Father's commandments. Now, we've been spending time in the evening, you know, looking at, at um, you know, uh, obeying the commandments of God, so I don't want to spend a, a great deal of time here, but I will say a few words. When you love someone, you want to do your best to please that person. And when that person happens to have authority over you, you especially want to honor them, and even more particularly, when the person who has this authority is exercising that authority for your good, and when it comes from with, you know, so much love. Now, I'd remind you that you serve a king, and that king is the Lord Jesus Christ, but do not forget that this king is a benevolent king, isn't he? One who loves you. He's not a tyrant who's constantly threatening you with damnation and judgment if you step out of line. That's not the way it is in the kingdom of heaven, but rather a king of love. Now, your king has done a great deal. He's done a great deal to move you to obedience by his love. I mean, the father loved you so much that he was willing to send his son to die for you. And of course, Jesus himself loved you so much he was willing to come and lay down his life for you. You serve a king who didn't come into this world to be served, but rather to serve you as he laid down his life for you so that he might redeem you and take you to himself forever when you die. And now this king calls on you to submit, to walk in his way of love. And again, remember what the Lord is calling you to do, not to do things that, that are bad. He's not calling you to do things that are harmful to you or to other people, but rather things that are loving. Now, other people might hate you because you're doing those things that are loving. That's true. They shouldn't, but they do because of sin. But what He is calling you to do is good. He wants you to walk in the same path that He walked, to submit to His commandments as He submitted to His Father's commandments. So I would ask you this morning, do you love Him? Are you walking in that path of love that He calls you to walk in, the same path He walked in as an example? That's what it means to know Jesus. Now, finally, and this is the, the main point, are you zealous for His glory, for Jesus' glory, for the glory of the Father, even as Jesus was zealous for the glory of His Father, for His Father's honor? Now, when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, He went up into the temple and He found those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and those, those were there for sacrifice. You know, it was, the animals were useful, right? I mean, it's not like they were selling, uh, you know, things that had nothing to do with what was going on there. Uh, and there were money changers who were seated at their tables who were making change for people who needed to offer monetary offerings. Now, when Jesus saw this, 
How did it make him feel? Well, he was offended for his father's sake because his house was to be a house of prayer for all the nations, but they had made it into a place of business. And so what did Jesus do? I mean, did he do what, what Christians often do and maybe what we find ourselves often doing, which is, oh, well, okay, I don't like it, but I'll pray about it and I'll think about it and maybe there's something I can do. No, Jesus, when he saw it being offended as he was, he became angry and he acted immediately. He made a scourge of cords and drove them with their animals out of the temple, he poured out the money of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who were selling doves to remove these from his father's house. Now, some suggested with regard to the doves that Jesus, you know, didn't just kind of rip open the cages and let them go free because the doves were a symbol of the Holy Spirit and he was kind of honoring that symbol I don't really think that was going on. I think he did that. He told them to remove them because all these animals that he drove out could be reclaimed. They could be captured. The doves, if you opened the cages and let them go, they wouldn't be able to. Jesus didn't want to steal from them. He didn't want to rob what they had. I think even the money changers were able to pick up their money. He just wanted them to know this was the wrong place for them to conduct their business. Now, we do know that um, Jesus will later on the second time that he cleanses the temple, which is spoken of in the other three Gospels, he's going to accuse them of turning his father's house into a robber's den. And it's certainly possible at this time they were doing something by what they were doing underhanded. It wasn't just that they were conducting business, but that they were stealing from the people. But again, Jesus saw it, and again, whether it was business or whether it was stealing, it offended him because this is not why his, father, why his father's house existed. Now, when the disciples saw what Jesus did, they remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus loved his father. And his love for his father was so great that he couldn't bear the fact that, that he was being dishonored, especially not in his house that had been built for his worship. It consumed him, which means it was basically eating him up from the inside, and he had to do something about it. Now, how does it make you feel, you know, when, when people you care about are dishonored or when they are injured? When somebody insults your friend, somebody says something nasty about your spouse or about your children, don't you feel compelled to, to rise up in their defense? Well, I think you certainly do if you care about them at all, if you care about their honor and, and their reputation. Well, if you care about them that much, that you'd be willing to do that, how much more should you stand up for God's honor? Because how much are you supposed to love Him with all your heart and mind and soul and strength? And what did Jesus say on another occasion? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife, and his children, and, and his property, his lands, his possessions, cannot be my disciple. And again, we understand Jesus didn't mean literally to hate them, but by comparison to our love for the Father, that by comparison, it would even seem as hate. If we would be uh, provoked when somebody would dishonor some, you know, one of these, how much more should we be when God is dishonored? Is that the kind of effect that it has in you when you hear him dishonored? What about when you hear his name blasphemed? What about when his name is lifted up in vain, when you see people making promises, I'm going to, you know, they're vowing to do this and that. I mean, such as when we take membership vows and then you see the same people breaking those vows constantly. How does that make you feel when his name is used in vain? How do you feel when... God's day is violated when you see people doing things on this day when they should be spending their time with the Lord doing things that are focused on Him. Instead, give their attention and their hearts to the world. How do you feel when you hear people say, God doesn't exist? God's not dead. I mean, you've maybe seen that movie and the philosophy professor who who's basically says to his class, I want you all to take out a piece of paper and write, God is dead 
sign your name to it, hand it in, and let's just be done with it. Well, there are places where that happens. There are people who feel that way. How do you feel about that? What does that, what does that do inside of you when they say that, that everything He has created is a cosmic accident? We don't need God to explain what we see. And how do you feel when you hear people saying things about Him that isn't true, besides the fact He doesn't exist, such as Jehovah's Witnesses who say that Jesus is a mere creature? Or the Mormons who say that He is one among you know, innumerable gods throughout, you know, throughout the universe, throughout various creations? Or how do you feel when you see Christians even holding to particular teachings that take away from the glory of God? You know, I want to remind you that's one of the reasons why, um, is it Augustus Top Lady, was really angry with John Wesley because he believed Wesley was taking away from God's glory when he was teaching that, that well, any man could just come to God and doesn't really need His grace. You've got to realize it is a work of grace from beginning to end, and we owe everything to God. I mean, how does that make you feel when you see these things, when you hear these things? Are you offended by them? Do you get angry? Are you zealous for God's glory and... Does that zeal move you to do something about it, to promote His glory? Now, again, we do need to be careful here, and we need to understand what it is the Lord wants and what He doesn't want, because He doesn't really want you to go out with a, with a whip and whip people, you know, that are doing things like this. Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, take the whip out, and psh, you know, get out of here, or, or something like that. No, and He doesn't want you to be like James and John, to, to pray that God would send fire from heaven to burn them up. We need to realize that Jesus reproved them for saying that, even though the, the town that they wanted to see consumed had denied and rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do need to realize that when Jesus did what He did, He had the authority to do this, didn't He? Because this was His Father's house and it was His house. He was a son over that house. He had every right to do that. So He's not saying He wants you to get physical you know, with these people and drive them away. But you do need to see that Jesus did get angry, and He did drive them out of the temple. But remember, He did it not out of hatred. See, anger and hatred often go together with us, but this isn't the kind of anger Jesus had, and this is not the kind of anger that we should have. Remember that Jesus on the cross prayed for these same people, and He prayed that, that God would forgive them for what they had done to Him. The Bible says you should get angry, you should let these things provoke your, your, your spirit, as it were, and get angry for God's glory, but you should not sin. Be angry, but do not sin, Paul says in, in Ephesians 4.26. Is that even possible? Well, some people don't think it is. Some believe it's always a sin to be angry. I think I read somebody this week who, who basically said that. I certainly ran into somebody this week who believed that, but others believe that the right response is to be angry and that it's possible to have a righteous anger that even though it may not be perfect because nothing we do is perfect, that you can be righteously angry and not sin, okay? Now, how do you know the difference? What are we talking about here? Well, let me give you uh, what John Gill says in his commentary because I think the distinction he makes here is, is very, very important. He's commenting here on Ephesians 4.26. And this describes what Jesus did in the temple. He says, be angry and yet do not sin. He says, there is an anger which is not sinful. For anger is found in God Himself, in Jesus Christ, in the holy angels, and in God's people. And a man may be said to be angry and not sin when his anger arises from a true zeal for God and religion, and he means by that, of course, the true religion, when it is kindled not against persons but against sins, when a man is displeased with his own sins and with the sins of others, with vice and immorality of every kind, with idolatry and idolatrous worship, and with all false doctrine, and also when it is carried on to answer good ends, that is, when it has a good purpose, 
as the good of those with whom we are angry. When Jesus drove them out of the temple, did it do good to them? Well, it was meant to, and it should have. Okay, so as the good of those with whom we are angry, the glory of God certainly glorified Him, and the promoting of the interest of Christ. Okay, there is an anger that, get, that can be provoked by the, the right things, or we might say the wrong things, or you know, the, the, the things that are wrong, and that move us to do good things. That is a righteous anger. But there is an unrighteous anger, he goes on to tell us. There is an anger which is sinful, as when it is without a cause, when it exceeds due bounds, it gets out of hand, when it is not directed to a good end, when it is productive of bad effects, either in words or actions, and when it is soon raised and long continues. That is, it happens quickly and it goes much longer than it should. There is an unrighteous anger, and we need to make sure that we don't let our hearts fall into that condition. That's not what we're talking about here, just, you know, getting the kind of anger that James and John had, Lord, destroy them, you know? No, but rather, Lord, turn their hearts and do good. God gives us that anger to motivate us to do something about it, even as our Lord Jesus Christ did. So ask yourself the question, do you get angry when God is dishonored? Is your anger like that of James and John, or does your anger move you to do something good, to repair it, something that will honor God, something that will help your neighbor. Now, I want to suggest two ways in which you might, well, by God's grace, be able to do this, because it's one thing to know, it's another thing, well, how am I going to do this? Well, obviously, being filled with the Spirit is a very, you know, big thing you need to have done first. You need to not only be a believer, but you've got to have the Holy Spirit. That isn't one of the two, but I wanted to mention a couple of other things. First of all, Remember who you are, okay? Remember yourself, remember your weakness, remember your sin. And secondly, remember that God can turn that person around that's doing that thing that's provoking to God. God may save that person. That person may actually end up being a brother or sister in the Lord, so be careful how you get angry to, uh, with regard to them. Let me just give you two quotes from... Well, from two very respectable ministers from the past. First of all, William Perkins, who was in the, the Anglican Church in the 1500s, who is considered the father of Puritanism. Uh, he writes this very good advice. Do not despise your neighbor, but think yourself as bad a sinner, and that the like defects may fall on you. If you cannot excuse his doing, excuse his intent, which may be good, or if the deed is evil, think it was done of ignorance. If you can no way excuse him, think some great temptation fell on him and that you should be worse if the like temptation befell you. And give God thanks that the like as yet has not fallen on you. Do not despise a man for being a sinner. For though he is evil today, he may turn tomorrow. And then Jonathan Edwards basically says the same thing, writing in his eighth resolution, by the way, I'd recommend those to you reading again, as to how he would approach others when they are in sin. He writes this, resolve to act in all respects, both speaking and doing, as if nobody had been so vile as I. And if I had committed the same sins or had the same infirmities or failings as others, and that I will let the knowledge of their failings promote nothing but shame in myself and prove only an occasion of confessing my own sins and misery to God. That's interesting, isn't it? Because that's not often how we look at it. Now, Jesus, of course, couldn't experience that because when he saw that sin, there was no sin in himself, just pure zeal for his Father's glory. But when we see others sinning, we need to realize, but for the grace of God, there I go, you see. The only reason I'm any different than this person is because God has had mercy upon me. And I need to remember that as I think about how I'm going to respond to that person. So I need to humble myself, and I need to realize, too, that God can bring that person to repentance. And so I should not respond in hatred or like the Pharisee, I'm clean, 
but you're unclean. God's, I'm God's favorite, but God's going to destroy you. And you, you just sort of rise up in holy indignation. That is not what the Lord wants us to do in our zeal for Him. Paul tells us in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So basically the point is be angry that God is dishonored, but don't hate the one that dishonors Him. Consider yourself humble yourself, realize that it's only God's grace that makes you to differ from them, and pray for them that God may turn them from that, and of course, speak to them if you can, and try to convince them to turn, but realize that God, again, may do that, and if He does, that's great. And by the way, if when Christians commit these kinds of things, we also need to bear in mind that if they're really trusting in Jesus Christ, that Jesus died for that sin. Remember that their sins are covered, so don't exact judgment from them when God has already done that on His Son. That is the grounds by which we can forgive others and that we can be patient and forbearing. So let me ask you in closing, do you know this kind of zeal for God's honor and glory? Well, if you know Jesus Christ, you do. If you know Him in a saving way, that is a part of your experience, and you need to realize it, you need to see it, and you need to try to promote it as best you can to follow Jesus Christ, to walk in His steps. But if you don't know this, then you really don't know Him. If you don't know this zeal, you don't know Him, and there's really only one way you can come to know Him, and that is by turning from your sins and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that if you will do that, he will receive you. If you come to Him in faith, He won't turn you away, but He will receive you. He'll make Himself known to you. He will transform you by His grace. So come to Him and let Him work that work of grace in your hearts and make you more like Him, that you might truly know Him. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take His Word, to apply it to us as we need to hear it.